Hey guys, this is going to be your anatomy and physiology lesson for Thursday, April 23rd. We are going to be looking at pages 80 through 84 in your books. You are going to need to, again, like always, write down all of the italicized or the words in italics as your vocabulary words, so write them down and define them. And you need to write down all of the... Uh, charts contained in the reading pages and then you also are going to need to be completing worksheet number 33. So if you remember just a quick little overview we're looking at the lungs we're actually getting into the anatomical structure of the lung and how those different systems those different parts of the lung work together to make breathing possible. Okay so let's go ahead and get into the reading. The pleura. The pleura. Wow, sorry about that. My brain just went. Mm. <laughs> Let's try that again. The pleura. Each lung is enclosed by its own double layered membrane called the pleura. Vocab word. The layer of the pleura that covers the surface of the lung is called the visceral pleura. Vocab word. The pleura layer adjacent to the interior of the chest wall is called the parietal pleura. Okay, so all of those different components of the pleura are vocab words. You need to make sure you look them up and define them. Recall the example we used when, illustrated the, when illustrating the pericardium. If you take a balloon partially filled with air and slowly press your fist into it, you get the idea. So again, remember we, we used that earlier where if you had that balloon, it was kind of filled with air and you went and you pushed into it and the balloon would then wrap around your fist. You would have those two layers of the, the latex of the balloon, the two layers of the balloon, they would end up, they would end up kind of touching and wrapping around your fist, okay? That is a, an illustration of how the pleura works around your lungs, okay? It is a, it's a thin line, it's a, it's, or a thin layer, right, of membrane, of tissue that lines each of your lungs, goes all the way around your lungs, and it serves kind of as a protective barrier, and it's one of the things that allows the expansion and retraction of your lungs that takes place during breathing. Okay, so that is the primary function of the pleura. Cells in the pleura produce a small amount of liquid that helps lubricate the potential space between the visceral and the parietal pleura surfaces. This is called pleural fluid. Again, vocab word. It reduces friction between the pleural layers and allows the lungs to expand and contract more easily. Even though the pleural layers glide across each other easily, the surface tension produced by the pleural fluid makes it very difficult to actually separate the layers. This helps keep the lungs expanded inside the chest cavity. Right? And you really want your lungs to stay expanded. Right? There is actually a problem where your lung, if you, your lung can deflate and it can go flat. Right? And it happens, unfortunately, like in automobile accidents. Um, those of you who play football, it can happen on the football field, you get hit hard enough, you can actually cause one of your lungs to deflate. And if that happens, it makes breathing very, very difficult. Okay, so again, okay, it's the pleura, right, this, this thin membrane, this thin layer of two, these two layers of tissue that surround your lungs, just another example of design, right, just the, the amazing, um, finely tuned, finely balanced, very precise design design that makes the functioning of your body, the functioning of your lungs work the way that they're supposed to. I mean that, that little layer of tissue keeps your helps to keep your lungs inflated so that you actually can breathe, right? So it's pretty amazing. Okay, and so if you look that's on page 80. You do have the chart here that gives you detailed information regarding the pleura and its locations, okay? So make sure that you're very diligent in copying all that information down. It is important information. 
Looking at the bottom of page 80, we got one of those gray boxes. There's a couple of vocab words in there, so let's take a look at this. These is, this is about plural problems, okay? So issues that can happen with that lining that goes around your lungs. As we described, the visceral layer of the pleura covers the surface of the lung, and the parietal layer of the pleura covers the inner surface of the chest wall. These layers glide across one another, but due to surface tension, they rarely separate. However, on occasion, the pleural space can be compromised due to illness or injury. One of the more common problems occurs when the pleural membranes become inflamed. This is known as pleurisy. Pleurisy can result in severe pain when taking a breath, and pleurisy is a vocab word. The pain results from the inflamed membranes rubbing against each other. Think of how uncomfortable it is when something rubs against your skin when you have a sunburn and you'll get the idea. Pleurisy is often the result of an infection, for example, pneumonia. However, other diseases can cause it. So again, guys, just think about that, right? That little bit of fluid that the pleural cells release, right? That, that helps to reduce friction. Imagine just how, you know, annoying and honestly just painful it would be if every time you took a breath, you could actually feel like you would if you take your hands and you kind of rub it here and you feel it. Imagine what that would feel like in your chest if every time you take a breath, you're literally sitting there feeling your lungs rubbing against the inner portion of your chest cavity, right? I have a feeling that would we'll probably get really annoying and very uncomfortable very quickly. At times, fluid can leak into the pleural cavity. When blood collects in the pleural cavity, it is called a hemothorax. This can be the result of a traumatic injury to the lung. In other situations, watery or serous fluid accumulates in the pleural cavity. This is called a pleural effusion. Vocab word. Effusions can have many causes such as infection, malignancy, or cancer, heart failure, liver disease, and kidney disease, to name a few. Regardless of the cause, when blood or other fluid accumulates in the pleural cavity, problems arise. If fluid prevents the lung from expanding properly, shortness of breath can result, as well as a significant dis decrease in the amount of oxygen that makes it into the bloodstream. The goal in these situations is to reduce the amount of fluid compressing the lung. This might be accomplished by medication, but often it requires drainage of the blood or fluid in the chest. A pneumothorax, yeah, pneumothorax, sorry, I want to make sure I had the word right. A pneumothorax occurs when air enters the pleural cavity. This most often results from lung disease such as emphysema or asthma but can also be due to malignancy, cancer, connective tissue disease, or trauma. All right, so that's just taking a look at some of the problems that can arise with those pleural membranes, okay, or the pleura. Okay, on page 81, we got Box talking about smoking. Smoking. If I could suggest two things to keep you healthy, there would be one do and one don't. First, do exercise regularly. Exercise helps you feel better. It increases your endurance. It is good for the health of your heart and lungs. Many people say that they even concentrate better when they are exercising regularly. You don't have to run a marathon every week. Just get off the couch, get out from behind your computer, and get active. Now for the don't. Never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, start smoking. There is absolutely nothing positive about smoking. It's not good for you. It's not cool, no matter what some people might say. It makes your breath and clothes smell bad. It costs money, which then just goes up in smoke. And it can damage your body in ways that time can never undo. Let me repeat, just don't. Smoking is one of the leading causes of death worldwide. Estimates place the number of smoking-related deaths in the United States at about 500,000 per year. So much worse than the coronavirus numbers. I mean, that sidebar, my bad. Compared to non-smokers, the life expectancy of smokers is reduced by about 13 years. 
If you stopped reading right here, that statistic alone should be enough to discourage you from ever taking up this terrible habit. In a non-smoker, the risk of dying of lung cancer is 1%. The risk of dying of lung cancer is around 20% for a male who smokes and around 12% for a female who smokes. And although lung cancer is very, very serious, it's not the only thing related to smoking. Smoking increases the risk of heart attack, peripheral vascular disease, cancer of the larynx, mouth, larynx and mouth, emphysema, pancreatic cancer, bladder cancer, and stomach cancer. I honestly cannot think of a single positive thing when it comes to smoking. Let me repeat, just don't. I would conclude this section with a painful personal note. My own mother died in her early 50s. She died of lung cancer. She was a two-pack per day smoker. Wow, that's a lot of smoking. Before she died, she begged her grandchildren to always remember what she went through as a direct result of smoking. She told them never to be so foolish as to start. Just don't. Okay, guys? It's good advice. Now, I do want you to point out, I want you to copy down this chart that you find on page 81 okay you need to copy that chart down it's important to see exactly the effect that the cigarette smokes has on the alveoli and the lungs themselves okay so make sure you copy this chart down this is a chart you need to copy alright page 82 section 2 how we breathe we breathe in we breathe out we do this on average 12 to 16 times a minute. Although we can consciously decide to take a breath, to breathe faster or slower, to hold our breath, or to take a deep, extra deep breath, the vast majority of the time we breathe without giving it a thought. And that's a good thing too, right? Just imagine trying to get some sleep if you had to think about every breath. So it's automatic when we need it to be, and yet we can have control when we want it. Our creator thought of everything. Now that we've examined the parts of the respiratory system, let's take a close look at how we breathe. Breathing basic, basics. At first glance, breathing doesn't seem all that complicated. It has only two parts, in and out. The first phase of breathing is called inspiration or inhalation. Vocab words. When air is taken into the lungs. The second phase is called expiration or exhalation. Vocab words. When the air flows back out of the lungs. Air goes in, air goes out. Nothing to it. But when you look closer at how and why the air moves the way it does, you begin to see the wonderful complexity. It's not simple at all. We will begin by seeing how we get air in. We'll get it back out later. Inspiration. Taking air into the lungs is known as inspiration. It is also called inhalation, inhaling, or just breathing in. It is such a familiar thing, isn't it? You expand your chest and you feel the air move through your nose and down into your lungs. Here is how it works. Recall our discussion about blood flow. How does blood flow? It flows from higher pressure to lower pressure. The higher pressure in the larger arteries causes blood to flow to the smaller, lower pressure arteries downstream. Airflow works pretty much the same way. Okay, so what actually happens when you're taking a breath in, right, is you're moving the higher pressure air out here into down into the lower pressure contained in the lungs, right? So when you're breathing in, as the lungs are opening up, there is a pre pressure differential between the air out just out here versus the air inside your lungs, the space in your lungs. And that pressure differential contributes greatly to your being able to take that air in. When the lungs expand or contract, the pressure in the airways changes. The resu this results in air flowing into and out of the lungs. Imagine the lungs at rest in the thoracic cavity. No inspiration or expiration happening. No pressure changes are occurring. No air is moving. Now, let's take a breath. So, breathe in. Inspiration begins with the contraction of the inspiratory muscles, the diaphragm, 
vocab word, and the intercoastal muscles. The diaphragm is the large dome-shaped muscle located below the lungs, okay? So your diaphragm, right? So you got one lung over here, one lung over here, and you can kind of feel, right, where your ribs come up, you can feel that, that kind of curve there. So your diaphragm sits right down here below the lungs, okay? The bases of the lungs rest on the diaphragm. When the diaphragm contracts, it flattens and loses much of its domed shape. As it contracts and flattens, the height of the thoracic cavity increases, making the space in the chest much larger. Air rushes into the enlarged thoracic cavity. Contraction of the diaphragm accounts for about 75% of the air movement in a typical breath. The intercostal muscles, or vocab word, are the muscles between the ribs, right? So, if you go, right, you're not kind of carrying a few extra pounds like I am, get lodged right in here. Oh, sorry. But anyways, if you feel, right, you can kind of feel your ribs. Well, for each rib, right, in between those ribs are muscles. Those are your intercostal, intercostal muscles, okay? When these muscles contract, they elevate. So again, we're going to move on, but I just want to point out, right? We got another chart looking at how inspiration works at the bottom of page 83. Make sure you include that chart. So again, the intercostal muscles are the muscles between the ribs. When the muscles contract, they elevate each rib like the handle on a bucket. This movement of the ribs causes an increase in the size of the thoracic cavity not only front to back, anteroposteriorly, anteroposteriorly, but also side to side or laterally. So anteroposteriorly means front to back and side to side is laterally. The reason for this has to do with how the rib cage was designed. The ribs are attached posteriorly to the vertebral bones and anteriorly to the sternum. When the intercostal muscles contract, the ribs move much in the same way that a bucket handle moves when it is lifted. It moves both up and out at the same time. About 25% of the air movement in a basic breath is due to intercostal muscle movement. As the thoracic cavity enlarges, each lung expands. This happens because the pleura, pleura help the lungs to stick to the chest wall. As the parietal pleura is in contact with the chest wall and moves outward with it. Because there is a lot of surface tension between the parietal and the visceral pleura, the visceral pleura and the attached lung expand too. When the diaphragm and intercostal muscles contract, the thoracic cavity expands. As the thoracic cavity expands, <clears throat> the lungs expand as do the airways in the lungs. This lung expansion causes a decrease in the air pressure in the alveoli. When the pressure in the alveoli drops below the pressure in the surrounding environment, right? Remember what I was talking about? Pressure inside your lungs as you're breathing in is lower than the pressure out here, which causes the air to move from higher pressure to lower pressure, right? It really is just an exchange of pressures. Or the atmospheric pressure, air moves into the lungs. This is a simple inspiration. In some circumstances, when a deeper or more for forceful breath is required, there are so-called accessory muscles that come into play. These muscles are not important during normal inspiration, but are used, for example, during exercise. These accessory muscles include the sternocleidoid mastoid, sternocleidoid mastoid muscles, the saline muscles, and the pectoralis minor muscles. Okay, so that is the entire process of inspiration or one breath, breathing in. All that stuff we just looked at, all is the reader, all that every part that I just read there, that is all of the process involved with just simply breathing in or inspiring. Okay, now we're gonna look at expiration. Getting air back out of the lungs is called expiration, also known as exhalation, exhaling, or breathing out. Isn't expiration just the opposite of inspiration? That seems reasonable, but there is a significant difference. 
you see, expiration is not ordinarily an active process. It is a passive process. At the end of inspiration, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles simply relax. As they relax, the diaphragms and the ribs return to their original position. In addition, due to their natural elasticity, the lungs contract back to their original shape. As this recoil slash relaxation takes place, the air pressure in the alveoli increases. When the pressure in the alveoli increases above the pressure in the surrounding environment, air moves out of the lungs. Okay, so right, so as you were, like I said, as you were breathing in, the air pressure within your alveoli, within your lungs, is lower than the pressure just out here in the environment, than the atmospheric pressure. But, as you're breathing out, once that alveoli and everything has, you know, they've taken in all the air through your breathing in, through the inspiration, right, then it actually ends up, and then the muscles start contracting, that starts to cause the air pressure within your lungs to rise. And so as that air pressure rises, it eventually gets to a point where it's at a greater pressure within your lungs than it is in the atmosphere, and that helps to force the air out. Okay? Because air, blood, water, anything is always going to move from higher pressure to lower pressure. Okay? Something that's really important to remember. <clears throat> this is a simple expiration. As you see, no active muscle contraction is needed for breathing out. There are times when we need a more forceful expiration, like when you are blowing up a balloon or playing the trumpet. I know about that. I play the trumpet. In these situations, the abdominal wall muscles can ex assist expiration by contracting and pushing the abdominal organs upward against the diaphragm. The internal intercostal muscles can also help by pulling the rib cage downward. All right. So that is actually that is all of the reading that we have for today. Make sure that you do identify all of those vocab words, write them down, define them. You do have one final chart covering expiration here on page 84 make sure you copy this chart down guys and other than that we will continue taking a look at how our lungs work next week i hope you find this video helpful and uh i'll talk to you guys later